For those of you who don't know me, my name is James Coates. I work as an associate chaplain at Canberra Grammar School and also part-time as the Archdeacon of South Canberra and I'm a regular member of the parish here, although fairly often come to the afternoon service. So if you, not, if you come along in the morning and I'm not here, typically uh, it's because that week I'm, I'm coming in the afternoon or possibly at another church. But it's a great pleasure to be able to join with you this morning and to be able to share God's word with you. So I'm going to open in a short prayer. Lord God, we do thank you for your word to us. We thank you that you have revealed yourself to us through it and that you feed us by it. And so we pray now that you would help me to speak clearly and faithfully and help all of us to understand more of your amazing love for us. For Jesus' sake. Amen. I wonder if you've ever thought, what is the relationship between Christianity and power? Power. When we hear the word power, we can sometimes feel a little uneasy, I think, especially if we consider power in relationship to the church. Often power in the church feels, ooh, danger, danger. Look out, look out, there's risks there. Things could go bad. Uh, whenever it seems there's a newspaper article about power and the church, it's almost always, it seems to me, framed as if church decisions are made in order to gain power or to hold on to power and not to let it go. And, and that's the guiding principle, as it were. And we can rightly be wary of power in the church. Perhaps we've seen ourselves instances where power was misused, where power was uh, defended and a person used it not to serve and love others, but for their own sake. So if power and the church is a relationship we're somewhat wary of, what about power in the life of an individual Christian? That's a slightly different angle. But uh, sometimes I've seen power and the individual Christian life talked about by those who aren't Christians as though Christianity is simply a crutch for the weak, something that the people who are lacking power cling on to in order that they might get some measure of power. Somebody might say, oh, oh okay, you, you just need that because you're too weak without it. I don't need God to be good. That's a phrase I've heard a few times. And it seems to me the implicit thinking behind that phrase is that, well, I can be good on my own. I'm good enough. I'm, I'm competent enough. I'm powerful enough. You need some external help for you because pity you, you're a bit weak. And, uh, and so that's sort of a way in which Christianity can be seen as a form of power for those who are weak, for those who need to grasp onto something, who haven't got life fully under control without it. But a very different way of thinking about power in the life of the individual Christian or in the life of the church <laughs> is a phrase that I've also heard from time to time, this time on the lips of strong, committed believers. And it often comes in the form of a prayer. We proclaim the name of Jesus over this nation or over this city or over this town or, or, or whatever it might be. We claim it in Jesus' name. I don't know if you've ever heard people pray like that. I have. Um, Stereotypically, I hate to speak in stereotypes, but it, it tends to be those who are uh, involved in Pentecostal churches or, or sort of on the charismatic side of things. Um, but I've, I've certainly heard that language used. And when I hear it, I think, what do they mean by that? It's, it's not exactly a biblical phrase. What, what is meant by it? There's some parts that sound almost biblical, but I'm not quite sure. Is it uh, an attempt to gain power over something? Well, on face value, it certainly sounds like that. So there's a few ways in which we might have heard of power in the Christian life being spoken of and thought about. But perhaps the most devastating critique, it seems to me, of power in the life of the Christian would have to be the words of Jesus. Two of his disciples had just sidled up to him and asked him for the places of honour and power at his side when he comes in his glory to which Jesus responded, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, but it must not be so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great must be your servant, and whoever would be first must be slave of all. So power and the Christian church, even power and the individual Christian life, doesn't seem like an appropriate mix, at least not always. We are very wary 
of attempts to gain power, and rightly so. So with all of that by way of introduction, I find it very interesting that in our Bible reading today, and it's the Ephesians reading, the second reading we heard that I'm going to focus on, what we read is a prayer for power. In verse 16, the Apostle Paul says, I pray that he, that is God, may strengthen you with power. In verse 18, that you may have power. And in verse 20, he praises God according to his power that is at work within us. So what is this power? How is it different from the power that we are so rightly wary of? And what does it mean for our lives? These are some of the questions I want to explore as we consider this passage. Now, as I mentioned a moment ago, it's Ephesians chapter 3 that I'm going to be focusing on. You'll find it printed in your uh, pew sheet there, so you might find it helpful to have that open and refer to it. I'm going to try and stick reasonably closely to it, working along. Um, inadvertently, I noticed there was a bit of a printing error. So you've got two versions of it printed there. One's been crossed out, helpfully. Um, and if you look closely, you, you'll see the two versions aren't quite identical, but they're pretty close. Um, that's because they're different translations. The Bible wasn't originally written in English, so it has to be translated into English. Lots of ways of translating it, lots of ways of saying the same thing. So you'll, you'll see the two differences there, but as you read them, you'll realise they're basically saying the same thing. But it is the second one, the wording, that I'll be following more closely. Now, this passage is a prayer. It's a prayer written by the Apostle Paul to Christians in ancient Ephesus. Now, verses 14 and 15 are the introduction to the prayer. I'm just going to skip over that introduction. Then we see the prayer itself in verses 16 to 19. And in verses 20 to 21 are the final note of prayer. Praise, sometimes known as a doxology, a note, a note of praise to God. And there's four things in this prayer that I want to point out. They are power, love, knowledge and fullness. So first off, power. And we see this in verse 16. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. The power mentioned here is spiritual power, power that comes through God's spirit. And the purpose is to strengthen us in our inner beings. What does that mean? Well, the inner being is a phrase that's used a number of times in the Bible, and it refers to what we're like on the inside. It refers to our character, as it were. Now, there's another passage which says, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. And this verse really uh, sort of draws attention to the contrast between what's going on in our character, in our soul, and what's going on physically in our life. All of us are getting older. I'm sorry to break that news to you. Some of you may not have realised. Many of you are very aware of it. But we are. It happens slowly, but it certainly happens. Even this last week, I uh, had the milestone of getting the first crown on one of my teeth. Hopefully the last, but I won't be placing any bets on that. Uh, our outward selves waste away, no matter how hard we look after them and how hard we try. It's just inevitable. But what Paul prays here is that we might be strengthened inwardly, in our inner being. In other words, that our inner character might be moulded and shaped by God's Holy Spirit. And unlike the process of physical ageing, this one isn't inevitable. It doesn't necessarily happen automatically. It does happen for some, and I've had the absolute delight over the years of meeting some godly, older believers. In some cases, their physical condition has deteriorated so much that anybody who didn't know them would look at them and say, oh, how pitiful, how, how hopeless. You know, that they've, they've got a foot in the grave already. They really have wasted away physically. And yet when you get to know them, they just radiate the love and the joy and the peace of Christ. And their character is so beautiful. It shines brightly. And so when you know them, you think, no, no, it's not that they've got one foot in the grave. It's that they've got one foot in heaven already. It's a beautiful thing to witness. But not all older people are like that. There are some who might physically be not that badly, well, badly off. And yet as they get older, they become more bitter, more abrasive, more spiteful. It's as if all the restraints that had previously kept that side of their character in check are no longer enough. 
So as we live and as we grow older, we must aspire to become more and more Christ-like. And we cannot do this in our own strength. We can only do it with God's help. So Paul prays here that our inner being might be strengthened by God's Holy Spirit. And then at the beginning of verse 17, he gives a parallel expression. He says, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. In other words, to be strengthened in our inner being by God's Spirit is to have Christ dwelling in our hearts through faith. Now, every Christian has Christ within them. It's almost the definition of what it means to be a Christian. But to live the Christian life means to want this more and more, to experience it more and more, to have it really shaping our character and our soul more and more. I liken it to a young man getting married. That was a little while ago now when I got married. But after I got married, my life changed. Strange things started appearing in the house. Flowers. Who'd ever think of putting flowers in a house? My diet started improving. I wasn't eating spaghetti bolognese five or six nights a week. My appearance started changing. My clothes, the daggy clothes I used to wear, they disappeared in the thin air. And I was still trying to work out whatever happened to them. And nice clothes appeared in their place. I don't know how it happened. It, it just happened. It was as if somebody else was making themselves at home, not just in my house, but in my life. And the Christian life is just like that. Christ makes himself at home in our life, in our soul. He moves in and he takes over and he starts doing a renovation work there. At the moment, Sky and I are having our ensuite renovated and it's very exciting each day we go in and see what extra little bit of progress is going on. And it's visible, you can see the things happening, but there's an awful lot of old that needs to be ripped out and taken away and gotten rid of. Well, Christ does that in our lives. He moves in, he takes over, and he renovates. Out with the old, in with the new. What is the old he gets rid of? It's the old character, anger, jealousy, selfishness, foul language, all that kind of thing. And in with the new character, love, contentment, kindness, generosity. This is what Paul is praying for in this prayer, that our inner being might be strengthened through God's Spirit, which means having Christ dwell more and more within our hearts, moving in, renovating, taking over, shaping us to be more like him. And then the second thing worth noticing in this passage is love. And you see this mention at the end of verse 17. We are to be rooted and established in love. Rooted is a gardening metaphor. It's about a tree putting down deep roots, roots that will nourish it, roots that will sustain it. Roots that will hold it in place when the storms of life come. Our roots are to be firmly planted in love. The love of God and love for others. Love is the soil of the Christian life from which everything else must grow. But then he switches metaphor and he changes to a building metaphor. This time he says established. And this refers to the foundation upon which our lives must be built. Love is the foundation of the Christian life. Everything a Christian does must be founded and built upon love. And the phrase reminds us that the primary renovation work that Christ does within us is to establish love, love for God and love for others. And this love is always a response to God's love for us. It's not as if he tries to stir up love for others without any reason for it. No, no. He teaches us and demonstrates to us and impresses upon our hearts God's love for us so that we can then respond from that with love for others. And we see God's love for us as we move into the third element I mentioned earlier, which is knowledge. He prays that we might have knowledge of Christ's love for us. The language Paul uses to describe it is nothing short of amazing. He prays that we may grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. The love of Christ is beyond measuring out. It is limitless in its dimensions. 
Paul prays that we might know it, and yet he describes it in the very same phrase as surpassing knowledge. He prays that we will know the unknowable, that we will fathom the unfathomable. There are four dimensions described here. When I was learning about objects, I was taught you only have about three dimensions. He, he talks about four dimensions here. Maybe one of them is time. But I don't think it is too far-fetched to see these four dimensions represented in the cross. The crossbar and the vertical beam where the Son of God gave his life for us as the greatest demonstration of love ever. The love of God is wide enough to embrace the whole world, long enough to last into all eternity, high enough to take us all the way to God's throne in heaven, and deep enough to reach even the most wretched sinner or to reach into the most helpless of situations. That is the love of Christ. It is expressed in the cross. And Paul prays that we might know this love, even though the full reality of it is full aware, is beyond our knowledge. Yet even if we glimpse just a tiny portion of Christ's love for us, such knowledge would be transformative. And then fourthly, at the end of verse 19, he prays that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. This is Paul's expression, Paul's way of saying that he wants us to be all that God wants us to be. Spiritually filled, spiritually mature. What makes someone a mature Christian? It comes as we know the love of Christ. Knowing the breadth, length, height and depth of the love of Christ, this love that surpasses knowledge, that is the secret to spiritual maturity and spiritual fullness. The person who has truly encountered Christ, who has truly experienced that love of God for him or for her, that is the person who is filled with the love of Christ and who is able to be spiritually mature. And then the person who responds to that in love, love for others, knowing the power of God in transforming their character. And then we get this final note of praise in the last two verses. Now to him, that is God, now to God, who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. And this is a beautiful reminder of God's power. God is a God who acts. He listens to us. We can ask. And he is able to do not just what we ask, not just more than we ask, but immeasurably more than we ask. And not even that immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine. You cannot even imagine the things that God is able to do. Such is his power and such is his love. And in verse 21 finishes by reminding us that everything should be done for God's glory. And the sad state of our sinfulness is that even with such a prayer as this, we could still construe it in such a way that we might pray with selfish motives. But verse 21 reminds us that God ultimately acts for his glory. And that the church, and he's not talking about a building here, he's talking about the people, the church, the people, the people of God, should be the theatre of God's glory. The place, the people among whom we see God at work. Where do we see spectacular miracles of God? We long to see them out there in big things, the kind of things that newspapers might report on. But all too often, the spectacular, powerful miracles of God occur almost invisibly, but they occur within the hearts and minds of people, people who turn to him, who experience his love, who come to know it, and who find their character being shaped and changed by the Spirit of God. That is the theatre of God's glory. And I have seen people change. I've seen people who I knew were bitter, unpleasant to be around. And yet through the work of God's Spirit, they became generous, gentle, kind, selfless, beautiful people. One foot in the grave, one foot in heaven. And it's a glorious thing to see. Well, I began this sermon by talking about power. We are rightfully wary 
of others seeking power, all too often we have seen power abused or used for selfish ends. But in this prayer, when Paul prays for power, he means the power of God's Spirit to strengthen us inwardly so that Christ may become more and more at home in us. Power to know the limitless dimensions of the love of Christ so that our lives may be rooted and established in his love and so that we might be filled to the fullness of God, spiritually mature, and power to do all this for the sake of God's glory demonstrated within us as God does even more than we could ask or imagine. So to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever.